This is a production of Cornell University. So as I think most of you know, or now all of you definitely know, I'm here, I'm in Rebecca's lab. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about basically two very different views, like a very micro and a very macro view of the same pathosystem, the maze cytosphere tersica pathosystem disease pictured here. So we've kind of introduced or really been focusing or thinking about um, this intellectual model, I guess, so to speak. It's like paradigm of different scales of resistance in Rebecca's lab in the past few years. So kind of moving from the molecular scale of resistance, like chemical warfare, you know, the interactions of different genes, all the way up to, you know, landscape resistance. What genes are deployed where? What's being grown where? What's the epidemiology of the pathogen? Um, and to look at each of these, you know, you obviously need to construct a different experiment to explore each of these things at its own scale. So, you know, that's what we've done in the molecular, you know, on the molecular side of things, with the molecular scope of things, you know, use an RNA-seq experiment to see what genes, what pathways, what molecular mechanisms are important at a given time. On the tissue side of things, you know, the, path, the, the pathogen is moving through a three-dimensional leaf. You know, it's, it's not homogenous. Um, so we've been doing histopathology experiments to study that. On the plot level, um, you know, gene mapping, look at, looking at resistance in the field, you know, on a row-to-row -row basis, looking at natural diversity, et cetera. And on the landscape level now, you know, just in the past two years, moving to aerial photography of drones. Um, and so, you know, like Rebecca said, I've been involved in a lot of different things. Um, you know, growth chamber experiments, RNA-seq experiments, histopathology things, um, often kind of like jumping in on different projects. Uh, maze transpose on mutagenesis was one of my main projects. Um, gene mapping, high throughput phenotyping, writing a couple of reviews at the Becca. But I'm going to basically focus on two main things, you know, dividing it up into this micro and macro view. Micro being an RNA-seq experiment using R gene isolines that we're wrapping up the paper now for. And on the macro scale, what's been funding me for the past two years, which is a phenomics or high throughput phenotyping project about aerial imaging of northern leaf blight. So some background, if you've heard me talk basically ever in the past five years, or if you've been in a cornfield, you're familiar with northern leaf blight. It's a fungal disease, it's a foliar disease. Um, it occurs in cool, wet areas like central New York State. Um, it causes these nasty necrotic lesions that you can see here. And as you might imagine, that's going to lead to lower yield and also lower silage quality, so fewer available nutrients, certainly. In terms of quantifying its effect, um, about NLB specifically, there's been, a, I don't know, new interest, a resurgence of interest in the past few years because it's been becoming a more serious problem. So um, some estimates of, you know, estimated yield loss um, from 2016 for the years prior, you know, the best estimate of this team of plant pathologists was that in 2015, NLB was accounting for about 25% of all maize disease yield loss, incurring a penalty or a economic loss of about $2 billion. Um, but it always looks more dramatic and striking when you see it in action. So this is a photo taken by our longtime lab manager, Judy Colkman, not far from here. And what you can see is that, you know, when you have the right weather conditions, which we often do in central New York, um, when you have the pathogen population there, when you have a non-resistant or susceptible variety, you know, you can get these devastating outbreaks. The causal agent is this fungus, Cetospheria tersica. Um, and the really critical things, I think, first and foremost about its biology um, are one, it's hemibiotropic. That is, it starts as a biotroph, feeding off living maize cells, feeding off living tissue, and essentially trying to avoid detection or avoiding detection. Then it switches into a necrotrophic phase in which it's killing off the host tissue and living off that dead tissue. And that's the necrotic lesions that you saw you know, before. Um, it's also haploid, like most fungi, and it mostly, so it can undergo sexual reproduction and meiosis, but mostly it's asexual reproduction. So these are the asexual spores. That's the vast source of, you know, the inoculum and the disease pressure. Um, and that's how you get these, like, lineages that cover a large area. So what does pathogenesis look like? Um, this is a freeze frame from a video that I'll play in just a second. But um, this is from one of the histopathology experiments I was running in the growth chamber. Um, so the orange is the maize leaf, the green is the fungal tissue. Um, and what you can see is there's the canidium. So those are the asexual spores, thousands or tens of thousands of them land on the leaf, germinate and try to penetrate the leaf. It grows through the mesophyll 
And then after, I don't know, between one and three weeks, depending on where you are and the resistance, et cetera, et cetera, it's gonna reach the xylem and then it colonizes the xylem very rapidly. You know, it's moving along the xylem, it can branch out of it. That's why you get those, you know, long skinny lesions. It's moving along the vascular tissue. So here's a video, both that shows it in a little bit clearer detail and also it's just very neat. Um, so this is a single spore that you're, you know, looking at in extremely fine detail. And once you see this, so this is, you know, probably on this tissue, you would not be able to see any sort of lesion, you know, just with your eye. Um, but eventually what's going to happen is that it'll keep going throughout this vascular bundle or like keep going throughout that xylem, um, expand, branch out into other vascular bundle, into other parts of vascular tissue and eventually clog it essentially um, and start killing off the host tissue. So what do we know about NLB resistance? Well, a lot, but quickly summarizing it. So, you know, this is kind of dichotomy of qualitative and quantitative resistance. I'm going to start with qualitative, so like R gene mediated resistance. There are four canonical, so to speak, long known R genes, the HT genes in this pathosystem. HT is short for helmet dysporium tersicum, an outdated name for the fungus. Um, and kind of like with the standard gene for gene model, you know, as expected, you've got this gene for gene interaction with AVRHT genes, avirulence HT genes in the fungus. So here's what it looks like. These are from, um, I think some greenhouse experiments by former grad student of Rebecca's, Chow Lin Chung. You know, here's it, it without an R gene, here's it with one of two different R genes. One of the interesting things about just even with only these four genes is that you know, we have different effects. It, not all of these, even on the like, level that's visible to your eye, are affecting the pathogen in, the different, in the same way. So HT2 that you can see here doesn't delay the formation of lesions. They still show up around 10 days afterwards but it does slow their growth and you get lots of this chlorotic yellowing. Um, I, think it's, I think it's clear on the TV. Um, and HTN, you know, pictured here on the right, it does not slow the, uh, the rate of growth of the lesions, but it does greatly delay their formation. So it's clearly, you know, acting at different points. Resistance is not all the same. And one of the interesting things is that so far, so not many of these genes are actually confirmed or known or cloned, um, but of the two that are, they're basically, they're not the, standard sort of R gene and AVR gene. So the R gene that is cloned is HTN, which is a wall-associated kinase. Um, and you know, this is not most R genes and the kind of canonical model or the typical R gene um, you know, is a cytosolic gene, um, is a cytosolic gene with a nucleotide binding and a leucine-rich repeat domain. Um, and HTN is not this. It's kind of part of the smaller category, like a fourth to a third of known R genes that are not really fitting in that mold. AVRHT1 in the fungus, um, which Gillian Turgeon's group has been working on, um, you know, most fungal effector genes are small secreted proteins. So they're about 20 amino acids, the fungus secretes them, and they interfere with the host defenses. AVRHT1 is not that, rather it's a secondary metabolite gene that has both polyketide synthase and non-ribosomal peptide synthase domains. So it's making its, uh, you know, it is a protein which is assembling other very, very small proteins and or ketides. You know, obviously, four R genes is not the entirety of what we know about resistance. Um, so in terms of quantitative resistance, and I, you know, I'm dividing these up, but, you know, it is a spectrum, and I think everybody kind of operates with this idea that, you know, both are these two kinds, but there is a spectrum, obviously, between quantitative and qualitative resistance. But in terms of quantitative, you know, there's lots of QTLs, there's lots of diversity for resistance. So this is an image I really like from um, Jesse Poland's. Uh, paper on NLB resistance in the maize NAM population. And you can just see, you know, this is what the, the range of natural diversity in terms of NLB resistance looks like. Randy Weiser, one of um, Rebecca's old students or former students, you know, did a meta-analysis just from a few different mapping studies. And, you know, the NLB QTO from, I think, five mapping studies covered 40% of the genetic map. Just found 29 QTO. And you can see from down here, you know, most of the QTL are present across, or at least, the loci um, have diversity across most of the germplasm. And again, I won't cover this, but I think it's an interesting parallel kind of to what we see with the R genes, specifically HT2 and HTN, is that um, Chao Lin Chung, another former grad student of Rebecca's, did this really interesting work about QTL isolines. So QTL also can have different effects. So she was working with these two, QTL isolated from the resistant line, TEX303, you know, both on chromosome one, but fairly far apart. 
Um, and one of them basically made the leaf harder to penetrate, so fewer conidia could penetrate, but it didn't slow their growth. One of them slowed the growth post-penetration, but didn't significantly reduce their ability to penetrate the leaf. So again, we already are going into this with this idea of like, oh, you know, they're operating at different points, spatially, temporally, chemically, et cetera. So moving on to what I've been working on, um, again, the micro scale is mostly going to be about this RNA-seq experiment. Um, and the experimental design of this basically has two parts because we're interested in looking at multiple things. So the first part is the host and pathogen combinations. Um, so we are inoculating one of two maize hosts, which does or does not have the maize R gene HT2 with one of two pathogen isolates, which do have their own genetic differences, but the critical one is that they either have the wild type, capital letters, A virulence gene, or the non-wild type, you know, little letters, um, A virulence gene. And so what that means in terms of R gene and AVR gene, so this is kind of the classic gene for gene model of R genes, is that if you have the R gene and the pathogen has the cognate wild type AVR gene, you know, we say wild type, but recognizable AVR gene, A virulence gene, you induce this resistance reaction like the one we saw a few slides before. You, you induce that chlorosis and that restricted lesion growth. If you know, the host is missing the R gene, obviously it's gonna be susceptible or as susceptible as your background line is. Or if the pathogen has the non-recognizable form of this AVR locus, it's gonna be a susceptible interaction. The second component of it is that we also wanna know about this biotrophy necrotrophy transition because hemibiotropes are, they're a really interesting model because you can compare them both to biotrophic fungi and to necrotrophic fungi. And there's hemibiotrophy that works differently among you know, different clades of organisms and pathogens. So in here, what we were doing, you know, the biotrophy necrotrophy transition in most germplasm in a growth chamber happens typically before 10 days, usually around eight or nine days after you inoculate. Um, so we sampled at four different time points, uh, days post inoculation, three, five, seven, and 10. And so we've got three time points within the biotrophic phase and then 10 time points in the necrotrophic phase. And then there's appropriate negative controls. So, you know, mock inoculated maize plants, on the host side, on the pathogen side, we have just pathogen isolates growing in a you know, petri dish and culture. And we have a lot of questions that we have asked and have answered and you know, that I think are really fascinating, but I'm really gonna focus on a small set of them under kind of two umbrellas. The first being the exploratory questions. Obviously like an RNA-seq data set or any you know, large scale data set has a lot of exploratory questions to ask. The ones that you know, I think are really fascinating for this are what does the biotrophy necrotrophy transition look like in both the host and the pathogen? What is the difference between a resistant and susceptible interaction? And then, you know, we have HT2 mapped, we have AVR HT2 mapped. Um, you know, somewhere in our transcript reads are the genes we're looking for. Can we use like wise things, like wise criteria to narrow down um, our very long candidate list? And so, Keeping this experiment straight, I think this is the most helpful plot. What we have is on the x-axis, the days post inoculation. Each line is a host pathogen combination. And the y-axis is basically what percentage of the reads align to the fungus, you know, essentially fungal biomass by percentage of the samples we're taking from those leaves. Um, and the first thing to point out is that, you know, between seven and 10 days, what does the biotrophy necrotrophy transition look like, among other things? It's a rapid increase in fungal biomass. This is really when it takes off, once it hits that xylem tissue. Um, and I won't show the PCAs, but essentially from three, five, and seven days during this biotrophic phase, the pathogen's gene expression is the same at all those time points. It's just reaching for the xylem. Not much is changing that we can detect. They're quite similar. Second one is that, you know, this is what an R-gene mediated resistance looks like. HG2 is inhibiting the growth of New York 1 because New York 1 has the recognizable form of the AVR HD2 locus, you know, what we think of as the wild type. The third point is that HD2 does not have an effect on the 28A isolate, which is, you know, this is an isolate which is carrying the non-recognizable form, or, you know, it's either mutated or missing or something, or they're somehow different. Um, you know, it does not have an effect on the growth. And the fourth one, and I, I don't touch on this, um, I won't touch on this in the discussion, but it's a really fascinating point, is that 28A is essentially a better pathogen. It's more vigorous. And we've always noticed this, uh, you know, anecdotally. Anyone who's worked with these two isolates has seen like, okay, this one's great. That one doesn't grow super well. It doesn't infect super well. And so we are also able, and I won't 
like go into this at all, but we are also able to say, okay, what's the difference between when you have no R gene, that is, they're both susceptible interactions, what do a weak and a strong pathogen look like? And what does a host responding to a weak and a strong pathogen look like? And how are they different? Because these isolates at a, in a lot of genes, in a, like a lot of portions of the genome, are 100% identical. So one thing people like to ask when they do a paired RNA-seq experiment, you know, the common thing is to say, okay, when I infect this host with NLB, or when I spray NLB onto this host, you know, looking at both genomes, both transcriptomes, what do the genes do? Do they go up or down? And then, you know, characterize that in some sort of intelligible way. So we've worked pretty hard to basically, you know, change this from a list of 200,000 p-values into something, uh, you know, tangible or understandable or that we can put in sort of literature form, you know, prose, as it were. Um, and so what we found basically was the most useful or the most informative was using PFAM domains. So what sort of proteins are they predicted to be in the host and pathogen? And then, you know, we can separate them out and kind of parse and break this down into, you know, an understanding of it biologically by separating out by time, by host, and by pathogen. Um, and I'm just going to focus here on maze domains, breaking down kind of the biotrophy and necrotrophy domains that I think tell a really interesting story about what hemibiotrophy looks like. <laughs> So what this figure is, this is a subsection of a figure from the paper. Um, on each row are the different PFAM terms, and I'll go through them and kind of what the significance is. On the columns are the time points, three, five, seven, and 10. And then each of those four squares is basically our four combinations of host and pathogen. Took a lot of finagling to get a lot of stuff onto this figure. But um, so some things that we have found, we would have been more surprised if they hadn't shown up. So during, these are, um, PFAM domains, which are enriched among the maize genes, upregulated during biotrophy, you know, three, five, seven days predominantly. So the first is, you know, leucine rich repeats and nucleotide binding domains, and in this pathosystem as well, wall associated kinases. You know, those are the classical form of genes which detect fungal effectors and or pathogen associated molecular patterns. Again, that's something that's totally not surprising to see, and we see it again. What we know of, especially about NBLRR gene regulation, is that you know, once the plant detects that there is a microbe you know, attempting to infect the leaf, it upregulates like all of these genes. Other things basically are attested to in the literature for other diseases, but they're kind of this is the first time that they're popping up on our radar. So lectins are a you know an antimicrobial protein that's been studying a lot of other past systems, but we've never looked at them. So it kind of raises a new hypothesis. Um, other things are not very well attested in the disease literature, but we can kind of make sense of them. So plaque 8 is a domain originally characterized in humans, which is why it's placenta-specific 8. But we can kind of make sense of it because when you look at what this gene does in plants, you know, there's a common implication of it's sensing mechanical damage and it's involved in calcium signaling, things that make a lot of sense in terms of disease response. And then we get these things that are very, very strange. And I actually, you know, I find these extremely exciting because so many chromosome maintenance genes, the class of DNA helicases, they've been implicated in diseases, but only in diseases where unconstrained DNA replication is a logical part of the life cycle and of the disease's strategy. So like um, soybean cyst nematode, they're trying to induce like rapid uncon unconstrained cell proliferation. This is the first time MCM genes are showing up. And even there, it's, it, it's a little limited in terms of the literature. This is the first time it's showing up in a disease like this where you don't have inducement by the pathogen of unconstrained cell growth. One you know, general way to kind of wave it away is like maybe this is a general stress response because MCM genes have also been implicated in response to you know, salt stress and drought stress. Mm -hmm. I have this kind of crazy hypothesis that it could be involved in neutrophil extracellular traps that is unspooled chromatin um, that the plant releases to you know, trap up the pathogen. There's a reason why this is kind of a crazy out there hypothesis, but I think it's really exciting to see something that is just not present in the literature, that we're the first to see this and notice this very strong signal for these genes. And then, you know, moving to necrotrophy, I'm gonna kind of skip over the ones that are induced throughout the whole life cycle, or the whole, you know, um, range of times, straight to, so these are PFAM domains which are upregulated um, or many of them are upregulated by the host specifically during necrotrophy. 
And so again, you know, what we get is the ability to put this into words that we can understand and kind of synthesize with our understanding of biology instead of just a long list of p-values and upregulation like log changes. So adaptins and ADP ribosylation factors, ARF genes, um, you know, if you're familiar with them, they're really involved in ves vesicle secretion, the secretion of uh, xenobiotic compounds. You know, glutathione S transferases, GSTs are a class of genes we've been interested in for like, you know, now what, like a decade, you know, because they have known roles in detoxification of pathogen compounds and in response to necrotrophs. And then again, you know, sometimes you just get NAM, no apical meristem is just a class of transcription factor domain. It could be doing a million different things. It's kind of hard to parse out. Um, but it is good to know that that is there and recognize it and keep it in the literature in a, like a usable form. So these lines were made, um, or these lines that we were using were isolines that either do or don't carry the HT2R gene. What we know about HT2, so it has been mapped to a pretty small region of chromosome eight by two of Rebecca's former students. You know, it's mapped pretty nicely. It is incredibly near the HTNR gene. And again, that was a wall-associated kinase, not the kind of cytosol-like NBS LRR gene that is common for our gene. And there are a whole lot of kinase genes in that region that are like, there's dozens and dozens of pretty plausible candidates when you just look at, okay, what genes are here? What do we think they do? Do they look like known resistance genes? And the thing that we are, you know, we're using the mantra, like work hard to not work hard. You know, somewhere in these reads, in the transcript reads, we have the, the RNA sequence, the coding sequence of HT2. Can we use intelligible criteria, you know, to basically parse out our very, very long list of candidates? So, you know, we just came up with a list, you know, one by one of these logical criteria. It should be in or near the mapping region, you know. It was precisely mapped, but, you know, it could be at least a few hundred KB away. Does it make sense in terms of what sort of gene it is? Um, is it polymorphic between the two lines? Because we can you know, do de novo assembly of the transcripts that align. We can do de novo assembly of all the transcripts and say, okay, where are the polymorphisms? Are there any? How does it compare also to what's already been sequenced in maize? It has genome sequence. Is it expressed in the leaf? Because if it's not expressed baseline, you know, just in a non-inoculated leaf and it's not induced, it's probably not doing anything for the plant. Um, and then as well, does it have higher expression in HT2? Because there are R genes where there is, you know, there are cases where there is no polymorphism between two alleles of an R gene. It's about the regulatory control of it instead. Um, so we kind of looked at all these logical criteria and it allowed us to narrow down our list from 100, 200 genes pretty narrowly down. And I think we have two strong candidates for HT2. And I think especially one of the nice things is when you go in and look at the sequence, of these reads, you know, you can find things that before were really at the top of our list. We say, oh, this makes perfect sense for HT2. This is a perfect candidate gene. And then you look and you say, there's no polymorphism. They're expressed exactly the same. You can't find any difference between these two genes, between the isolines. You know, we can use what we have in hand to say, that needs to go down the list. This other one needs to move up. So the first one is, again, these are both the protein kinases, you know, things involved in signal detection. Um, it has homology to a wall-associated kinase in rice. It's close-ish to the mapping center, not as close as we would like. Again, we're, at first we were looking at, okay, let's just look at the five genes right near the mapping thing. But we know that recombination can be kind of iffy in this region. Um, you know, it's expressed in the leaf. It is induced by NLB infection and it's polymorphic. And the other nice thing is that the HT2 minus allele pretty closely matches B73, which we know does not have HT2. So it fits in with what we know about that. We did look at other genomes um, because a lot, you know, more and more are being sequenced every year, um, but we're not as confident about whether or not those genomes have HT2, et cetera. Second one, you know, again, we've got a leucine rich repeat domain, which is a classical domain involved in, um, you know, associated with disease resistance genes. It's a protein kinase. It's got much higher expression in our HT2 plus isoline. And again, there's polymorphisms and the HT2 minus allele, um, which is from a line S11, which is fairly similar to B73, closely resembles B73's version of this gene. Um, and so, you know, obviously we would need to, we have some money for transgenic or transformation with Matt Willman in the new plant transformation facility. You know, all these need to be confirmed, but I think 
The nice thing about looking at what you have in hand is that you can turn a list of dozens of fairly plausible candidates that are all vaguely on equal footing into two much stronger candidates. So moving from these kind of exploratory questions into the more hypothesis driven one, you know, we also do have things that we, hypotheses that we bring to the experiment and say, we wanna know if this is true in our system or not. And the two we'll focus on are on the host side, um, gene expression versus resistance in the field. And on the pathogen side, gene sparse region. So the hypothesis that we're bringing to the table in terms of NLB phenotype in the field is that NLB resistance is related to the baseline expression, the non-induced expression of non-inoculated plants of genes that are upregulated in response to NLB. There are a lot of reasons why this is, you know, a moderately plausible hypothesis, or this might be the case. Um, you know, lines can have, a resistant line might have high, like what we call a hair trigger, might have high sensitivity towards um, fungal domains or, you know, uh, microbial signals. It might have really high baseline expression, you know, basically pre-constituted uh, defenses. There are also a lot of reasons why this would totally not be the case because, you know, induced express, in, induced defenses and baseline, you know, constitutive defenses are different for a reason. You don't always want to be panicking and have all of your defensive mechanisms firing on all cylinders. But also it was because, you know, one of the reasons why I brought this to the table is we had the data to ask this interesting question. Um, Carl Kremling published a paper this year, um, which I think a lot of people saw. If you saw his exit seminar, it's really fascinating. Um, and what he, you know, uploaded all the data from this, and it is gene expression in a lot of different tissues for the maize 282 diversity panel. So a lot of diverse lines. Um, Judy Kolfman has taken NLB resistance metrics on the same panel so we can compare the expression of genes in multiple tissues to what it, how resistant is the adult plant. Um, the way we're doing that is just with ridge regression, we measure the accuracy of our predictions by tenfold cross-validation. So you have this metric of, okay, you know, our is related is kind of a vague term. What we're looking for is how well can we predict NLB resistance from expression of these genes using those as the predictors. And so what we have here is, um, the y-axis is the correlation between the predicted and the observed values. The x-axis is how many genes we're using to predict. Um, and whether those genes, the two panels, are whether those genes are just randomly sampled from the genome after we filtered for, you know, they should be expressed, there should be diversity, and they should be a useful predictor. We don't want to throw garbage in there. Um, or are they from our list of kind of NLB-induced genes? Um, and then as you can see, you know, in both of them, as you add more predictors, you get a better prediction, you know, as you expect. And so what we see is when you're using a small amount of genes, that should actually be 0.16, couldn't change that, but um, it's about twice as good when you're using NLB-induced genes. And so what I mean by twice as good is that if you limit your predictors to genes which are induced by NLB and you say, from these, I will predict NLB resistance in adult plants, you do about twice as good a job as just using expression of some randomly sampled genes of the same number. As you increase the number of genes, they get you know, more similar because if you just increase the number to 35,000 genes, you'd be using the exact same gene sets. You'd be using all of the genes. Um, but when you're using 3,000, you know, there's, there's still about a 0.1 bump in prediction accuracy when you're limiting this to say, I want to only use genes that are responsive to NLB to predict the adult NLB phenotype. So we're really excited by this because we kind of had a lot of dead ends on um, other similar questions, and we found this really interesting, you know, result out of like, looking through Carl's data. The second hypothesis I want to touch on is that gene sparse regions tend to be, tend to have more pathogenesis related genes, whereas gene rich regions will tend to have more, you know, basic life cycle genes. And the reasons for this are kind of numerous, this is coming out of, this or model is coming out of Sophie and Kamun's lab. Um, you know, if you have a gene sparse region, there's going to be more strand slippage, you're going to have more mutations. And it's not, the third one is not necessarily implied by being gene sparse, but, you know, one of the other metrics of whether it's related to pathogenesis is, is it expressed in planta. And what we found, which is really interesting, is basically one half of this model applied to our system. So this is a heat map. Um, genes are binned in the X and Y axis by their distance to the nearest neighbor in the three prime and five prime direction. And the color is of all the genes that are that far from the nearest neighbor, what is the mean ratio log transform of their implant expression to their control expression on a plate? What you see is that, you know, there's that red patch in the corner of genes that are far from both of their nearest neighbors. 
basically if a gene is over 10 kb from a neighboring gene on either side the average ratio of implanta to azenic expression is about 200 versus a baseline of about one um, so we see that playing out essentially in our pathic system you know gene sparse regions do have genes that are highly expressed in planta but we don't see the other half of the hypothesis so this is a similar um, or the models. So this is a similar heat map. You've got KB in both directions. And the color scale is the mean log transformed DNDS, that is the ratio of non synonymous to synonymous substitutions. A low DNDS means you have very few non synonymous substitutions. So that is, you know, anything new is being purged, that stabilizing selection. A very high DNDS is you've got, you know, selection for diversity, functional diversity. And essentially what we saw is that, you know, genes and gene sparse regions were not any faster to evolve. So we only get half of the model being confirmed. So backing up, you know, somewhat, backing up to our entire model that we think about resistance under, um, we've been looking really at the molecular scale, you know, we've been looking at just a few genotypes. But again, you know, our group does a lot of field work. We're going to move over to the extremely, extremely macro scale and thinking about things on, you know, Rather than thinking about them on the tiny centimeter sample scale, think about them on the meters and kilometers, or at least acres scale. So the project that's been funding me for the past two years um, has been basically centered around detecting NLB lesions from aerial images, from UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, which is how everybody prefers to say drones now, because it sounds friendlier. Um, and so there's lots of reasons, you know, I think many of us now have heard various justifications for why high throughput phenotyping is useful. You know, you want to have, um, you want to remove that bottleneck on all of your progress. You want to be, uh, have phenotyping that's on the same scale and speed and accuracy as your genotyping. But specifically about NLB, you know, in this specific context, why would you want to do this? There's kind of two groups of answers. The first is for breeding and genetics. I actually think probably the most relevant answer is that if you are already flying a drone, um, which I think is going to be more and more common for more and more breeding programs. You know, if you already have the images adding on and you already have a pipeline that is fairly simple to use, adding on another trait um, is much less difficult than, you know, doubling the amount of traits you score in the field. Um, you know, obviously you want higher precision and accuracy. So Jesse Poland from our lab did some studies on human accuracy for NLB. Short answer is people are good, but there's certainly room for improvement. Um, and then I think one that's especially relevant for NLB is that the main metric we take is after flowering so that in a breeding program, um, what we measure is later in the season, you know, far after flowering, what we measure is the percentage of disease leaf area. It's very hard to score a large area for pre-flowering disease traits um, because you're looking for pretty rare lesions or you're looking for something pretty rare. So I think this would, you know, if you can measure something pre-flowering, you can also choose the male parent. And so you theoretically double your gains. But also, you know, we don't work really in management. We don't really work on fungicides or things of that nature, but we want to be also be aware of how this could be useful for management. I think similar thing, more traits at once. Uh, I think, you know, all growers want to inform, they want to know whether it's worth it to spray their fields with fungicide, given corn prices and the probability of disease loss. Um, and one that's pretty, you know, like, far out in the future, but a few groups are working on is variable rate fungicide application. I think this is really exciting for like larger areas. You know, if you have a wet spot in your field, that's the one that's gonna get hammered most likely with disease worse. Um, and so if you can, or if you know, it's coming from one direction, you, know, you can use the epidemiology of it to save money. So how did this project work? You know, we have field experiments of various sizes. We take drone images of them, um, thanks to tireless work from uh, Ethan and Nick Kaspar from my Gore's lab, uh, going to some of the troubleshooting of that. We use human annotations, so basically showing where the lesions are, and we feed that into a convolutional neural network, a CNN. I'm going to try to explain this briefly and clearly what a CNN is, because I think it's, it's relevant for how all this project works. So a CNN is a class of machine learning model. It is the current standard for recognizing objects from images, you know, just in an automated sense. So when you upload a picture to Facebook and it says, oh, this is Kyle's face. Do you want to tag Kyle in this? What it is using is a CNN that has been trained on images of Kyle's face. So that's what it's using. And it's the same with you know, all of Google's things, any self-driving car are using this basic form of model. It sounds more complicated than the math behind it actually is. 
um, the central things are these convolutional layers. So convolution is a mathematical function that you can apply to matrices. These layers have filters, which are different matrices. You slide the matrix across an image, which can also be thought of as a matrix of n dimensions. Um, and then essentially what it gives you is this, it gives you a high value essentially where it sees um, a type of feature. And on the bottom layer, it's a pretty simple feature. So it might be vertical lines or the color blue or something like that. There's a pooling layer, which all that is, is it's down sampling the resolution, like when you shrink an image. And there's a higher convolutional layer that is looking at combinations of the previous filters. So every time you move up a layer, you're looking at more and more complex combinations of the layers below. And when you get to something on the third level, that's where you start seeing, okay, one of these 256 filters is going to respond to lesions. One of them might, you know, or if you're optimizing it for faces, this is going to respond to Kyle's face. Um, and then ultimately you can use that to predict whether there's a lesion in the image or not. Or So the first phase is, you know, the majority of it, which is annotate lesions, train the neural network and see how it does. So we have multiple field experiments, you know, we're always running different disease trials um, and we need to image those. There are a lot of challenges to imaging a field, an entire field at the level where you can see NLB lesions. I mean, these things are centimeters to millimeters, you know, in size. When you capture the images, we want these to be really high resolution, much higher than people are normally taking when they use drones in agronomy, um, which means that you need low altitude, you need low, which gives you low coverage. You need to be flying slowly because we don't want motion blur. Once we analyze the images, you know, we can't trust just anybody to analyze NLB. So the way that Google and Facebook do it is they outsource all of their annotations by looking at what, who you've tagged. You know, anytime that the uh, website asks you if you're a human or not, and it says, click on all of the street signs or transcribe this image or something, they are using you to outsource what they want to uh, train a self-driving car to do. Um, they're use, they've used you to outsource all that work. But obviously, you know, a random person can't just say, oh, this is NLB, you know. We also need a vast amount of data to train a CNN. Um, so we kind of run out this thing of human annotation. It was just a wall that we climbed over. So what I mean by human annotation is we first tried just saying, okay, here's images with NLB, here's the ones without. Didn't work super well. So we moved to kind of the next level of detail, which is, okay, here's a picture, a lot of lesions in here. This is actually off a drone. It's not cropped at all. Um, this is the actual resolution that we were getting. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Ethan. Um, draw a line down the axis, do it for the next lesion, do it for the next lesion, do it for all the lesions of the image, and then do that 100,000 more times. As you can imagine, this was not fun. <laughs> it was by no means. But ultimately, that's the scale that we needed to train these models accurately. And so ultimately, what we do is then feed them into the CNN. We have some really great computer science collaborators, formerly at Cornell, now at Columbia. Um, and what can we do? So like in the simplest view, what can we now do that we could not before? We can take a handheld image, feed it through our network, that has been trained on tens of thousands of examples of what a lesion looks like and where it is in an image. You can get out a heat map where it says, I think these regions are NLB. Um, you know, we can do the same with an aerial image. So again, this is a non-crop, this is straight off the drone. Um, we can feed that into the network and then you can see this is a little bit grainier as it were, but you can do the same exact thing. You know, here black is where it sees the lesions and you know, just flipping from one to the other, you can see, okay, it's getting that, it's getting that, it's getting there, it's getting this little one here. So before I get to the question, that's the natural next question, which is how well are we doing this or how good of a job are we doing? I wanna bring in one last point, which is the idea of consensus. So similar to when um, you have a jar full of jelly beans and if you have three people guess, the mean of their guess is almost always gonna be better than any individual guess. You know, the consensus of multiple people, the mean of their guesses is usually the most accurate. Same concept here, if you subsample your image data and your training data slightly differently, train three slightly different CNNs, you'll get three slightly different predictions. Choose that same image, and here are the three A, B, and C, we were calling them, you know, here are the heat maps from the three, um, here are the heat maps from the three prediction networks. And you can see, you know, this one maybe is, the one on the left is maybe a little bit too sensitive, but that could be useful, you know, when you're looking under different light conditions. So how good of a job do these networks do? You know, on handheld images, it's reaching ultimately about 97% accuracy. And you can see 
the validation set here, you've got like 90% accuracy with each one. And then when you combine them, you get about 98. Um, the difference between a validation and a test set is that a validation set is one that you can test how good you're doing. And then, you know, maybe go back and say, okay, this method didn't work. Let's go use this method. Whereas the test set you leave until the very end and only look at once. Because if you optimize your, uh, if you optimize your model by looking at how it does in the validation set, and then you test it on the validation set, obviously it's gonna do a little bit better. On the UAV images, um, you know, here's on the x-axis you can see the epochs, which is like the different rounds of optimization of the CNN. Um, and on the y-axis is the accuracy, and it ultimately hit test set accuracy of about 95%. So 95% is fairly good, but you can imagine if you were flying over a field and you looked at 100,000 corn plants, you know, you'd be getting 5,000 false positives. It says NLB is here where it's not, which is unacceptable, you know, for if you're trying to screen a large area. So what we want to do, um, what I'm working on right now is basically supplementing annotations using crowdsourcing to improve our network's performance. So again, this is what we were doing so far. We literally just went through um, and drew lines at 100,000 lesions and used that to train the network. Um, and we had talked about using polygons, you know, circling the lesions, but we just said there's no way we can make that many. You know, it's just too much of a time constraint. But why do we want polygons? So here's an example. Um, this is an image from a group actually also at Cornell who's training a network to recognize materials like carpet, wood, and cement, and things like that. Here's what their network saw when it was trained on point clicks. So something like click three points on the carpet, click three points on something made of wood. Here's what it saw when it was fed polygons of that same thing. So you can see, you know, you're getting these crisp annotations because you're feeding it a vast amount more data when you circle all of the points that are wood or carpet or whatever than just click them. So we're essentially, you know, on the same points one and two. We have all our images, we've trained them on fairly low resolution things, but we're getting these kind of blobs out. It knows there is a lesion there, it has learned to recognize lesions, but we're not getting these crisp outlines. So we want to get polygon annotations. So the task is fairly straightforward, draw boundaries around all lesions in this image, do that 100,000 times. Um, and the way that we kind of went around this is divided up into two things. We've already done this thing on the left, find the lesion, which, you know, we tried shopping that out to anonymous online workers. It did not work. They are not trained pathologists. I've never seen Northern Leaf Flight. Not a surprise. Um, what we found is that when we basically do that and then pass it over to um, people who aren't experts, you know, who we just randomly hire for this task, um, it actually works pretty well. So. I set up a platform on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. We were using it for a couple of different tests as well, um, working on annotation of like grassy weeds. What you can see is this is what they got, um, what we gave to them, and they got pretty minimal instruction, honestly. Oh, and Mechanical Turk is an online platform where you can hire people, anonymous online workers for simple tasks, and they're typically paid by the task. Um, and this is what the three people did. So you can see the outlines in red, the area of all three in green. I mean, they honestly did a pretty good job. Guessing that none of them had like had much experience with this specific corn disease. Maybe they have, they might have been trained pathologists, but I am just taking a stab that none of these people, they just, you know, humans can recognize objects and file directions fairly well. Other times they don't. Um, so you can see. <laughs> so a lot of this, there was just a lot of data sanitation that needs to happen with this. You know, when you obviously are shopping stuff out, and this is why we have them do it, you know, three people do each task. But ultimately, it worked fairly well. So we were kind of thinking of this mantra has come up a lot in the project, which is fast, cheap, and good, pick two. Um, in terms of cheap, so we're paying about 12 cents per lesion, four cents for, to each person, then one of that, they get three, and then one goes um, to Amazon. Um, it's blazingly fast. So I think we're actually paying a lot more than most. I've looked at a lot of other people's things. We're paying like several times more than most other tasks. So we get it done in a few hours. If you post 10,000 things, it'll be done later that day. Um, and then the ultimate question is, how is the quality? How are these people doing? So this is a histogram of the overlap between all pairs of polygons. So the overlap is you know, the area of the intersect of, them, of the two of them over the area of the union of both of them. Um, so how much does it overlap? And it's between pairs of polygons and one set of annotations that I put up on MTurk. And what you can see is basically three things. First is that most of these annotations are like around 75% overlap, which when you look at it like on an image, you're like that's pretty good for these, you know, things which are taken literally from a moving drone. Um, there is a small subset of workers who are just drawing random garbage, but it turns out actually, thankfully, they're pretty easy to filter out. 
um, because these lesions are, you know, they're only taking up like 10%, 5% of an image. So it's really easy to see when somebody's just, you know, putting in garbage. And we found out that was actually pretty nice. And then a lot of the stuff in the middle is also useful because what we found is that when, we, when you look at an image and you're like, this is kind of blurry, but I think there's a lesion here. And then you hand that image to three people who are generally competent and seem to be doing a good job. And none of the three of them can agree on where it is. You probably gave them a bad image. So this is actually serving as a nice, I went back and looked at hundreds of these images where people who otherwise generally did well were like, could not agree on where the lesion was. And it was a really nice test to basically say, this image, like we shouldn't be feeding this into our network. It's you know, low quality, there's blur. Um, no three, re three reasonable people can't agree on what the lesion is. And so now kind of we're wrapping up the very last piece, which is how much does this improve CNN performance? Once we've got these things that basically move from a crude line that are, is kind of drawn down the axis of the lesion as best I could get to these polygons, how much are we improved? So again, dipping back to the what can we do side, you know, it is exciting. Our group was the first group who, and I think still is the only group, who has done recognition of diseases in the field of just images taken, you know, just without any sort of like correction or clipping of the leaf and putting it on background. Um, the sort of thing that you could attach to a tractor or just walk in the field, take on your smartphone with no background, um, you know, take from a drone. So it is really exciting there. But obviously, you know, looking at this heat map, we want to be able to get that more refined and do better. So moving back to the micro and macro kind of final thoughts section, you know, it's, um, as I, I'm writing things, it like, and when you look at all the projects together, it can seem kind of disparate because you're like, okay, well, here's an RNA seq experiment, and then here's machine learning with drone images. They they seem kind of disparate, even though they're about the same type of system. But I think the valuable thing about that is that, you no, know, there's plenty of stuff known, and there's really fascinating literature and components to each of these scales of resistance, and you have to design different experiments to understand each of them. But then also, you know, the different scales kind of how should I say this, cover for what the other scales can't tell you. So when you're on the molecular scale, you can see, okay, here's something that's invisible to the eye that's happening, you know, on the molecular scale of this molecule interacting with that one, you know, but it's not always taking into account the fact that the pathogen is moving through this three-dimensional leaf, which is trying to fight it off in different ways at different points, you know, three-dimensional structure that fights that. When we're doing greenhouse and growth chamber experiments, you know, we don't usually have the room or the space or the ability or the time you know, deploy things which is looking at diversity on the hundreds of plant scales, you know, looking at natural diversity, where are the genes, how do they perform in the field? And then when we perform in the field, you know, we're limited by how much humans can get. Everyone who does field work knows that at some point you just physically can't get any more hours out of the week and out of your undergrads. Um, and so that's, you know, we're moving to this kind of final scale. We're saying we want this to be less and less constrained by just how much we can walk and see in a day. And I think, you know, all of these are extremely exciting scales to be studying. And so with that, I left, I have a lot of thanks, as you can see, because um, a lot of people have been incredibly excellent. So Rebecca has been a wonderful mentor, both encouraging me to do more out there things like machine learning from drone images, but also to focus and write my papers. <laughs> so both keeping me on track and encouraging me to try new things. Um, Gillian Turgeon and Mike Gore, it's incredibly valuable to have two people who have questions on like hardcore fungal genetics and meiosis or on, you know, how we should be processing this data flow for high throughput phenotyping that have excellent people to ask. Um, the Nelson Lab personnel and staff, specifically our longtime lab manager, Judy Kolkman, who's my compatriot in the field for basically all my field seasons. Um, greenhouse and field personnel, anyone who works in the greenhouse and field knows that they're the ones who make everything run. Um, the Nelson Lab has a wonderful cohort of grad students, former and current, who are always giving really excellent advice about everything. Ethan and Nick from the Mike Gore's lab are the ones who afford a Herculean amount of effort to get our drone images taken. Um, the Lipson Lab at Columbia is our computer science collaborators who have been really fruitful to work with. Synapsis is a wonderful organization, and I say that not just pandering because most people in here are grad students, but it's a, it's a great organization to just you know, have lots of opportunities and outlets to talk about plant biology. Obviously, the love and support and scholarly mind of Lauren Brzezowski, who is flying back from Japan right now, I think. Um, and then funding from the NSF National Robotics Initiative in the past two years, the NSF DR Mays grant um, right here for my first three years, and the Joint Genome Institute, 
um, who funded the, a lot of the RNA seq work and fungal genome sequencing. And with that, I will take questions. Judy. <laughs> um, so the RNA sequence is really interesting, and the results you got are really fascinating. How you lined it up with the RSS as well. Uh, um, the first time point is that three days. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on what you could find in those first three days that aren't covered in those other three, five, seven, or ten days? Yeah, probably a lot, especially about the germination success of the canidia. I mean, so you know, so when we spray canidia, these asexual spores in the leaf, we're spraying thousands to tens of thousands of, to hundreds of thousands of them. Um, and we really think from looking at the leaves, I mean, you know, it's like not many of them succeed into becoming a lesion. So I think that's probably what we're missing is the germination success of the canidia. And I mean, I think there's lots to miss there. And so that's the RNA seq paper that has come out about Estrosica that we were fed Scupas, you know, that was really in just the first three days. That was, I think their own time point was like one day post inoculation. You're gonna look to that. Thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So um, I, I noticed that the images that were taken by the drone um, had dark background. Yeah. And, and so were they taken under special circumstances, or I imagine that on a very average sunny day, you'd have more of a brownish, dirty background. And how would that influence the sort of their CNN performance? I picked the nicest images. <laughs> Oh yeah, so the question if I did here is about, you know, these have a dark background and then as well, you know, so this is obviously taken on a cloudy day. We've got really nice contrast. It's taken early-ish in the season where everything's dark green still, you know, that was not the question, but another, I think, relevant point. And you've got this dark background where the leaves really pop out, you know, if it's bright and sunny, um, you know, how does this perform? So the, we have a lot of images that look a lot worse than this, where the lesions are less clear. We have images from later in the season where you start getting the confusing things of, um, you know, senescence of the lower leaves versus what an NLB lesion is. Um, you know, we have plenty of images where, and especially, you know, you can imagine with the leaf, you get this big sunny reflective patch right where the leaf curls over because we're taking these images straight down. Um, yeah, and so the, the accuracy performance values that you saw, the 95 to 98%, well, 95 to 97%. Um, yeah, so those are all using, that's using both shady images and sunny images, it's using images from earlier in the season where things are still this dark blue-green, using things from later in the season where things are starting to senesce. So we took a fair amount of pictures over you know, time courses in different conditions. Yeah, good question. So a little bit of a follow-up on Judy's questions. Ed, when you're sampling for your gene expression mm. at day 10, mm. what tissue are you actually looking at? Because in the susceptible interaction, a lot of it's presumably going to be dead. Yeah, so the... Um, the sampling was done basically around the lesion um, for 10 days post inoculation with these. What you generally see, well, it'll take a while for me to scroll back, but what you generally see at 10 days in the growth chamber um, with these backgrounds is, um, you know, the lesions are starting to form, but it's not totally, sorry, it's a PDF, so it's not totally crusty like this. Um, it looks more similar to this H22 here. Um, so this would be like that. How much spatial variation do you think there is in gene expression? Oh, uh, con. Yeah. <laughs> so you're fine. You're so, <laughs> we, yeah, so we've done different things. So the sampling for this experiment was done by Santiago Medeiros mostly from our lab before he moved on to postdoc. And then I've been sending another grown, the one with QTL isolines. We tossed around a lot of different ideas to basically minimize sample variance. Um, and for that experiment, what I ultimately settled on was basically taking a big swath the same size as what we were sampling for histopathology. So you're averaging out a fair amount of area around, um, around where the lesion's incipient. But also, so we inoculate the whorls, and so you get most of our spores in a pretty obvious band. So basically most, most of the infection in the growth chamber when we whorl inoculate is happening within about two inches. Okay. I think mine is related to this string of questions, but my impression is that in a lot of these hemibiotrophic uh, interactions mm. uh, the biotropic phase is only like 48 hours yeah so that's an so, <laughs> so is this such a different kind of interaction than any other hemibiotropic fungi yes i think it is i mean so the the majority is on wheat pathogens and magnaporthia and rice like of what we have to compare this to 
and then as well, so we've also been, you know, our collaborator Pima and Curdy works on Southern Leaf Blight, which is called a hemibiotroph, but that biotrophic phase lasts like 12 hours. So then there's a question of, is it quiescent? Um, in general, this is fairly similar to what's been observed in Magnaportha, where the literature is pretty rich. Um, I don't have a good answer for in terms of how it behaves relative to the wheat hemibiotrophs. So I'm going to entertain one last question. Pima. <laughs> CN, regards to the CNN, have you been able to test its accuracy across different leaf flights? No, so this is one thing that we, oh yeah, so the question was, have we been able to test the accuracy with regards to different leaf flights? So that was one thing we really wanted to do at the outset of the grant, and just basically we're not able to do because there's so many complications to the earlier steps. But yeah, so, I mean, northern leaf flight and say anthracnose leaf flight, they look really similar. I mean, like, once you've seen them a lot, you can be like, okay, yeah, I can tell some diagnostic things, but they look really, really similar. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a that's a obvious, you know, a next question to ask. Cool. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.